put us back into context, we talked about database design having a number of steps. Requirements analysis, where you talk to your users and try to understand what they're trying to capture. Conceptual design, which is done using the entity relationship model that we learned in the last lecture. And then logical design, where we translate that ER model into a database schema in the relational model. And so we're now at the phase where we can talk about schema refinement, where we try to get more correctness baked into our schema. The main issue that we're going to try to resolve today is the evil of redundancy. And basically, the issue with redundancy is to have replicated values in your data. And you might think that's bad because it leads to wasted storage, but wasted storage isn't that evil. What's far more important are what are called insert, delete, and update anomalies. The basic issue is that you have, if you have replicated data and you expect your data to change over time, you are asking for trouble. And we'll see examples in just a moment. The solution to redundancy is going to be what we call functional dependencies. They're a form of integrity constraint that we haven't seen yet, at least not in a general sense. And they'll help us identify the redundancy in our schemas and then suggest refinements uh, to get rid of that redundancy. And the main refinement technique we'll look at is called decomposition. It splits the columns of one table into two tables, and so doing, in so doing, it uh, can get rid of redundancy. So it's often a good thing to do, but you don't want to do it uh, unnecessarily. So we're going to try to do it judiciously, and we'll talk about what that means as we go. The idea behind functional dependencies is really very simple. If we take two columns of a table R, let's say X and Y, we'll say that X determines Y, and that's notated X arrow Y, if given any two tables, any two tuples in R, if their x values are the same, then their y values must be the same. So in the example below, we see that if the x value is 2, the y value must be 4. And so we can say that this table observes the functional dependency x determines y. Note that this does not necessarily hold in the reverse direction. The value of y says nothing about the value of x. In particular, we have three rows with the value 4 in y and different values in x, and that's okay. So here is an example of a table that satisfies the functional dependency x determines y. Formally, what we'll say is that an FD x determines y holds over relational schema r if for every allowable instance little r of r, that means for every state of this table, subsequent to inserts, deletes, etc., if we're given two tuples, t1 and t2, and we project t1 down to the column x, and we project t2 down to the column x, if those are the same, which is to say they're equal on column X, that implies that when we project down to Y, they are both the same as well. Okay. Now, one generalization from the previous slide, X and Y are actually sets of attributes. So these projections can be down to a set of columns, not just individual columns. So when we say X determines Y, X might be a set of columns and Y might be a set of columns. Just a minor generalization of what we said before. A functional dependency is with respect to all allowable instances. So it's something that you declare as a constraint on legal states of the database. And you declare this based on what you know about your application. This is not something you necessarily learn from data, although you could, in principle, learn suggestions from, for functional dependencies by looking at example data. But this is something you're going to specify as a constraint that the database is going to enforce. The database should make sure at all times that the functional dependencies hold. And if someone tries to update the database in a way that breaks the functional dependencies, their update will be rejected. So think of this as a way to preserve correctness. It's a, it's a constraint to check. It's not something necessarily that we learn from data. So you can't look at a table and decide what its FDs are, but you can certainly look at a table and decide which FDs it might violate. So some key terminology on this slide that's important. First of all, let's answer the question, how are functional dependencies related to primary keys? Because we've seen primary keys before, and they seem kind of related. And the truth is, primary keys are special cases of functional dependencies, where they're of the form k, arrow, all the attributes of a table. So a primary key is a functional dependency where the right-hand side is all the attributes of the table, and the left-hand side is a primary key. All right, and here's the notation that we're going to want to generalize now so we can talk about different kinds of keys. We'll use the term super key to mean a set of columns that determines all the columns in its table. So it's exactly of the form k determines all attributes. Any such k is a super key. Now a candidate key is a special kind of super key. It's a minimal set of columns that determines all columns in its table. What do we mean by minimal? Well, first of all, we say that it does determine all the columns, so k determines all attributes. And secondarily, for any proper subset of kL, L does not determine all the attributes. So k is as small as it can be. You can't take out any of its attributes and keep its 
keyness, okay? So that's a candidate key. It's a key that's minimal. Now a primary key, which is what we've talked about up to now, is just a candidate key that we've chosen for the relation to be the primary key. So it's just a primary, it's a candidate key that we, we name as the primary key. All candidate keys could be primary keys, we'll just pick one and call it the primary key. So it's just a matter of uh, choosing one. Um, the primary key is no different in any essential way than any other candidate key. Finally, one more detail, an index key or a sort key has nothing to do with any of this discussion. Index and sort keys are just columns used for sorting. They may not involve duplicates, they may not involve constraints whatsoever. So when we talk about index and sorting keys, we're actually talking about something very different than today's lecture. So just keep that in mind. Okay, let's look at some examples of um, functional dependencies on an entity set. So consider the relation hourly employees, which has this schema, social security number, name, lot, which you can think of as a parking lot, a rating, a wage per hour, and the hours per week that the person works. Okay, And then we can denote a relational schema for this entity set by listing its attributes. And we're going to take as shorthand the first letter of every attribute. So in this case, it's S-N-L-R-W-H, which I might pronounce snurlw. And this is a set of attributes, actually. It's S, comma, N, comma, L, et cetera, right? It's a set of attributes. We're just going to denote it um, as a string like this. And then we can use the relation name as a shorthand. Instead of writing down snillerw, we can just write down hourly amps, okay? And those will be synonymous in the discussion going forward. So what are some functional dependencies on hourly amps? Well, let's make some up. Let's say that SSN is the primary key. That means it's a key, so S which is the social security number, determines everything. It determines all of Snuller. The rating determines the wage per hour, we'll say. So R determines W. If you're rating four, that means you have a particular salary. If you're rating five, it means you have a different salary. And then the lot determines the lot. L determines L. And that's a trivial dependency. And that's always true for any attribute, that it determines itself. We actually don't have to state that functional dependency. It's trivial and it's given. So R determines R and S determines S. We don't have to write those down. Okay, but we'll call those trivial dependencies.